Is um, Coach Marvin on? Oh, no, I don't see her on. I found the raise hand feature if anybody's interested. <laughs> of course you did. Well, um, yes. Where is it? If you go into the participants list, yeah, and then down at the very bottom is a tiny little hand that you can raise your hand on. But I'm clicking in and I don't see it on my... It's next to your name in the participants list. Oh. Well, that's not very helpful, is it? No. It's not like, ha, it's not like this one. <laughs> Good morning, Commissioner Myron. Uh, can we do a quick uh, audio and video check? Sure can. Hi. Oh. Sounds great. Thank you. Are we able to get the meeting started? Great. Of course, no, I'm not ready. Please hold, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I was too busy playing with the raise hand function. All right. Good morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, March the 2nd, and this morning we have a board briefing for the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners. We actually have two board briefings, and we are going to start with an informational board briefing on COVID-19, and we have our public health team with us. I think we have uh, Jessica Guernsey, public health director on the line to kick things off. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yep. This is Jessica Guernsey, Public Health Director of Multnomah County Health Department. It's nice to be with you all again. Um, I think we have a slide deck that should be ready. There we go. Thank you, David, so much. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. I'm joined this morning by um, Dr. Jennifer Vines, our health officer. And we're really pleased to have with us um, Adrian Daniels, uh, the Deputy Director of Integrated Clinical Services. Uh, next slide. This morning, um, we wanted to provide a few updates with you all as we normally do every two weeks. Want to go over um, the COVID 19 data for um, Multnomah County, including our testing, um, positivity, and hospitalization data as we normally do. And then we want to spend a little bit of time talking about the shared departmental uh, vaccine equity framework that we've been mobilizing between public health and our integrated clinical services and really go through some updates on the work and how we're um, addressing some of the different issues around COVID-19 vaccine equity across um, the department. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Vines. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Great to be with you today. Um, if we could go to the next slide, I'm going to just review what are now very familiar to you all. Um, this is our standard public health tool, our, our epidemic curve, and you can see um, the peak there if you think back to around Thanksgiving. And um, boy, people have just really stuck with precautions and driven that curve back down. You can see um, we're at levels uh, comparable to last summer, um, which are amazing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the percent positivity. So this tries to capture volume of testing and number of positives. You can see that also dropping. Um, there's a little bit of back and forth because of severe weather uh, and a, a break in testing and then maybe a bit of a rebound. Um, but again, we're looking for sort of big picture patterns and you again, some some really good news here. And next slide. And thanks. And this is uh, probably the purest indicator people would say of COVID activity um, uh, because of some of the um, nuance around testing behaviors. Uh, if you look at hospitalizations for COVID, again, you see the same uh, trend that is very encouraging um, with continued measures around uh, race and tracking of how some of our communities uh, continue to be disproportionately affected uh, by this virus. Um, but overall, uh, incredible news 
um, I'll go ahead and answer the question everyone asks, which is, is this, is this the vaccine? Is, you know, what, what why? Um, I, I think it's too early to say this is the vaccine, even though I think we're making good progress there. And I think we will start to see a dent, especially as we get into um, age 65 and over, uh, over the course of this month, which we know are the highest risk uh, to be hospitalized. Um, I think this is people taking precautions and taking them seriously and sticking with them, which is um, amazing. Um, so any chance I get to thank people for that, uh, I take it because uh, this is really the product of a lot of people making choices day in and day out to drive these numbers down and put us in really uh, a, a very reassuring place for now uh, with the uncertainty ahead around the variants and our frankly poor visibility on how common those variants are that may be more contagious, that might get around the vaccines that we have. Um, those are open questions. And so I think we're gonna remain in a vigilant stance, even though um, the numbers as of today are encouraging. Um, I, maybe I should pause because I'm gonna hand it off to Jessica. I think we're gonna pivot quickly to vaccines. Maybe I'll pause. Uh, Madam Chair, I don't know if you wanna take uh, some time for questions or just push on. Yeah, does anyone, um... Uh, Commissioner uh, Stegman, do you have a question? No, thank you, Chair. Commissioner Vega Peterson? No, not at this time, thanks. Commissioner Jayapal? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just one quick question. Um, Dr. Vines, I'm, I'm looking at the positivity, positivity chart and then the hospitalization chart. And, you know, what you can see is that the positivity rate that we're at now is about where we were kind of mid-summer of last year, but the hospitalization rate is well lower. So I'm just wondering whether there's there's some good news there as well, whether there's something happening that means that the rate of hospitalization relative to positivity is different or whether that's just sort of some sort of random thing. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Sharp eyes. I So I... I don't know that I can prove this, but I think I could make an educated guess that with the progress of vaccines in long-term care facilities in particular, who are the most vulnerable and the most likely to potentially land in a hospital, I would guess that that, that may be where we are actually seeing uh, a dent in our hospitalizations versus cases. That's great. Thank you. Commissioner Myron? No questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vines. Jessica? Great. Next slide, please. So um, this is, a, at least on my screen, a very blurry map of um, Oregon with um, Multnomah County stats um, that you can access every day on the COVID website, um, OHA COVID website, that tracks the number of vaccines that are either in progress or um, fully completed for Multnomah County. Right now, Multnomah County has about 109,000 um, uh, folks in our jurisdiction that have received at least one dose and about 53,000 that have been 53,000 people that have been fully vaccinated in Multnomah County. So like I've said in the last few briefings, although our, our start to vaccination rollout was rocky, things are moving forward and we're starting to see some progress in real numbers, which is really exciting. Like, like Dr. Vine said, um, we're hopeful that getting some of these vaccines out early to the right populations that were suffering extreme illness and death is really making a dent in those hospitalization numbers that we're seeing. And we need to continue all of the prevention um, efforts that we all have been practicing that have made such a huge difference in our local numbers. Next slide. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our framework and I apologize, I have a little bit of a hoarse voice, um, for approaching um, vaccine equity in Multnomah County. Um, so it goes, <coughs> excuse me, it goes without saying that part of what um, we are uh, addressing in Multnomah County across the region and the state um, is really looking at historical wrongdoings um, that are embedded within people's um, communities and decisions around um, whether or not they're going to get vaccinated. So a large part of what we are doing in our vaccine equity framework is really um, being in dialogue with communities, particularly BIPOC communities, to talk through, quite honestly, historical wrongdoings on the part of public health and medicine, um, and really working through questions that people have about their hesitations and community history that's very important to address. Um, 
So a large part of what we are doing is, is continuing to be in dialogue with communities um, to talk through questions about the speed at which the vaccines have been developed, um, questions about what are in the vaccines and questions about, again, like I said, historical wrongdoings that really lay groundwork for questionable trust. Part of what we've been doing is um, hosting community listening sessions. Um, as I said, part of this is to address um, historical wrongdoings. And part of it is really um, on the practical level, understanding from people what are the things that we need to consider in our own vaccine operations to make sure they're accessible to people. This has been a real challenge um, at the large vaccination sites. So in our role, what we are trying to do is be in dialogue and community listening sessions with folks to understand what are the components that are needed um, on the operational level. So this obviously includes things like language access, both in terms of materials before someone makes a decision to get a vaccine to interpretation on site or by phone, um, being able to see um, familiar faces at a vaccination clinic, working with trusted community partners. All of these elements are things that we're continually hearing from folks that we're building into our operations. And then, <clears throat> of course, um, again, in these community listening sessions, really just integrating um, what community wisdom um, we're hearing um, to make sure that we are asking questions about the prioritization itself. Um, there is inequities built into many of those assumptions in the prioritization and working through that on the local level to make sure we're not reinforcing um, exclusive practices. And then lastly, we're really excited to be sharing an approach with our community health centers, with our FQHC and integrated clinical services to use data and community wisdom to prioritize those that are most at risk that we need to make sure have access that they may not have through the larger vaccination sites. Next slide. <clears throat> so I know it's a little strange to do a screenshot of um, Facebook Live, but I couldn't figure out another way to um, show these, <coughs> excuse me, pictures. Um, this is a live shot, a screenshot from an event that um, we participated in last Thursday night with the Tongan Women's Association of Oregon Radio and ERCO. Um, this is one example of the events that I was um, referring to uh, during the last slide. Um, we pretty much any night of the week, um, you will find us engaged in one of these dialogues. Again, very important to answer questions about specific issues related to the vaccine, vaccines, the vaccine development, specific questions and wisdom from the community regarding um, access to vaccine clinics. Um, so this is a huge part of what we've engaged in across the community over the last um, several weeks. Next slide. And then this is just another example. Um, I know you all have heard much of the work that the REACH program has been doing um, in the community, absolutely critical, important work. Um, this event was also on Thursday evening, um, specific uh, to the African immigrant refugee community. Um, again, a, a community dialogue to answer questions about vaccine, um, understand what's needed in the vaccine operations and communications, a really important part of what we've been doing. Next slide. <clears throat> and then again, I'm sorry, this, at least on my screen, this is very hard to see. I apologize for the, for the small print. Um, this is one of the um, vaccine one pagers that our communications and public information team has put together over the last few months. Um, again, obviously one of the strategies that we have been um, working furiously on is ensuring that very complicated vaccination information is available in multiple ways. And this is just one example. I believe this is in Russian. It's hard for me to see closely um, on the screen. Um, but if, if you go on our website, you will find dozens of um, vaccination development, access, appointment making, one pagers that our team has developed to ensure that people have materials to answer the questions that they have. Next slide. <clears throat> and then finally, I just wanted to talk about some of the highlights of the work that we've been doing. Again, gathering information, looking at our data for Multnomah County, understanding where the barriers are and hearing from 
community members and trusted community partners regarding access to vaccination clinics. This is just a high level overview of the BIPOC focused clinics that we've done thus far. Um, obviously, these are these are clinics that require um, a second dose. Um, so we have to do, you know, another clinic to make sure people get their second dose. And this is not all of the vaccination work that we've been doing, but I really wanted to focus on these key partnerships um, <clears throat> and events to highlight the equity framework. Um, so I think you all know that we have had um, a vaccine clinic at Gresham High School, which are greatly appreciative of the partnership, um, focusing on BIPOC traditional health workers, um, this was when we initially um, kicked off um, ensuring that we were reaching the 1A group, which includes <laughs> healthcare workers, and we administered 600 vaccines at the event. Second event that we held at Gresham High School focus was on um, BIPOC elders. Um, we administered 500 vaccines. Um, you probably remember um, some of these were interrupted by our unfortunate winter weather, but we were able to reschedule them. <laughs> the third event is the Rockwood Boys and Girls Club. Um, again, focus on uh, BIPOC elders. Um, we uh, administered over 500 vaccines. And then fairly recently, um, we had an event, uh, REACH sponsored an event with Highland Haven Church. Um, again, focus on African-American and BIPOC elders with about 400, over 400 vaccines administered. And then our most recent clinic was in partnership with the Pacific Islander community and open to other BIPOC elders where we administered over 400 vaccines. So these are just the beginning phases of some of the events that we've been able to um, staff. And I really um, wanna thank our teams, our, specifically our vaccination teams that have really worked tirelessly to um, provide this service in the community. There's lots of real time learning that's happening in all of these um, events, and they have been a tremendous force in ensuring um, all of this happens. And by the same token, just reflecting back on my earlier slides, um, we cannot do this work without partnerships with community based agencies. They are really going to the mat in terms of making sure community voice is heard and that we're doing better each time that we launch a new vaccination clinic. So we're really proud of this work. We're learning as we go. Um, and continue to stand up these vaccination clinics, but this is just a sampling of what we've done thus far. Before I turn it over to um, Adrian, are there, do you want me to take questions now, Chair Before? Yeah, well, we can run through questions. Um, we'll start this time with Commissioner Myron. Um, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Jessica. That, this is just um, really brilliant um, and so appreciate the um, the work that has gone into um, just the coordination and the outreach and the engagement with um, all of our uh, commun the community based organizational partners and um, and reaching out to these specific communities. I love this slide in particular that that talks about um, these specific groups and, um, you know, and obviously uh, maybe in future slides, we will, um, we'll see where more, where are, um, you know, the, how these allocations in these groups compare to our overall allocation as a county um, and, uh, and, um, really appreciate working on this, building on it. I'll have some broader questions later, but um, thank you so, so much. Mr. Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Jessica. Yeah, no questions at this point, but just really want to appreciate this work. It is, it's so exciting to see, um, and I, I just appreciate the vaccination team. I appreciate your work on making sure that we are taking the vaccine to where it's needed. Um, and literally going out to people. I think that's just so, so important. No, thank you for that. Mr. Bega peterson uh, Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I do have a question, but first I just wanted to add my thanks. Um, I think, you know, your comment that you, like almost every night you can find um, you doing um, this outreach to, in partnership with community to get the word out about vaccines and the importance of getting them in a, in a way that's um, 
appropriate and um, for communities is fantastic. And I know your days are very, very busy too. So this is going, you know, always above and beyond in the weekends and in the evenings. But I think these partnerships are fantastic. And that is, um, this is exactly the work we need to be doing to make sure that um, that the vaccines that we're giving out like match the the propensity of, of COVID within communities. Um, the earlier chart that we showed had like for the first time and almost since the beginning of the of the COVID pandemic, that the numbers of cases within, you know, white and BIPOC communities were about equal, even though we know that's also, you know, still represents an overrepresentation um, from BIPOC communities. Um, but do we have the same data or, or any similar data about vaccine data in terms of, of the population? I think I've seen that that chart in, in previous presentations, but don't know if that's something that you're going to be getting to. But just curious about like where for Multnomah County you know, we're seeing the breakup from, um, you know, from the white population or BIPOC populations. Yeah, um, we are able now to get data from our alert data system, which is the vaccination system the state uses to track vaccine that we're going to be able to give um, more refined data in the coming weeks that will help us look at um, just kind of what Commissioner Myron was saying. What, what, what vaccine have we given? Where is it going? What's the proportionality similar to the way we look at our um, testing positivity and hospitalization rate. So that's been fairly recently that we've been able to get that data. So we're working on getting a similar graph so that we can get into a routine with you all to be able to report it vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the county. And one thing that I just wanted to say is I appreciate the, the acknowledgement around the um, uh, you know evening uh, community readiness work around vaccine. And I just, I wanna say that our team, it is definitely not just me. I There are, so many people who are working so hard in the evenings and weekends, especially ensuring that communities have what they need to get questions answered. So I just really want to call that out. Great. Thank you, Jessica. And Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I did have a couple of questions. And of course, yes, thank you to everyone. Um, I think this is the new normal of going above and beyond, which, which you all have been doing. Uh, and I would dare to say that uh, I'm really proud how Multnomah County, uh, I, I seem to only read about our county really prioritizing uh, BIPOC communities and marginalized communities. So uh, really, really happy about that work and especially to see so many East County sites. But I did have a question about what do we see, if you can look into your crystal ball, Jessica, about uh, like, you know, people have mentioned like using the Kmart site. Do we see, and I know that, you know, it, it, it's all dependent on the vaccine, uh, but do we see, what do we see for the future of Gresham High School and these other sites that we've already established? Or do we need to be looking at other larger scale models or drive through models? Yeah, that's a great question. The, the COVID crystal ball that I'm asked to look into every once in a while. Um, I think, <coughs> excuse me. I think that one, we have to be conscious of how um, all of these facilities are used on a daily basis. We're going to enter a phase here, obviously, with um, our numbers being um, positive, which is great, where we're going to see start stuff start to reopen. So we're going to hit sort of this um, place where. Um, not everything that we may want to use as a vaccine facility is going to be available for a variety of reasons, which honestly, some of them are really good. So um, we are looking at um, several sites across the county. I think ultimately the place that we want to get to is more stable sites, um, especially as we um, have the state criteria open up, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end of the presentation, because the sheer number and volume of folks that that is going to include and we need to still continue making sure there's accessibility in all the fronts that I talked about that may or may not be available in some of the very large sites are going to need to be in place. So what we're working towards is being in a place where we can have more permanent sites that are a little bit more like our testing sites. Um, but we didn't want to wait for that to happen to make sure that we were responding to community gaps that we were hearing about right away, if that makes sense. I appreciate that and how, and I know that you're taking this into account, but I'm just wondering um, how are, how are the pharmacies playing into our planning? Yeah, the pharmacies, um, there's 2 different um, ways that the pharmacies have been playing in. I think some of you all know that um, uh, the pharmacies were very engaged in the long term care facility vaccination work, which is amazing work. 
Um, the federal government has instituted a um, pharmacy program and they have been getting vaccines for the last couple of weeks. Not a lot. It's been in the range of about 100. Um, the federal government picked the sites that they were giving vaccine to. That being said, we have had conversations with um, different vaccination chains about potential partnerships. I think what we're most concerned about is making sure that we can actually isolate and focus on the populations that we know have gaps. Um, that can be a little bit challenging with the pharmacy work in that you can, you know, anyone can go online and, and, and request an appointment. So we're looking at some partnerships um, with pharmacies um, to see how can we focus some of those um, some of those um, appointments, as well as some hard to reach populations that we continue to have to um, figure out creative ways um, to serve, including homebound um, adults, which is gonna be another area that we're gonna be looking at in the coming weeks to make sure folks have access to vaccine. Um, so looking at some of those partnerships to put in place. Great, thank you. I really, again, appreciate your, your surgical approach to reaching um, BIPOC populations and uh, just appreciate hearing about how, how you all are, are going to accomplish that and recognizing the difference between, you know, what pharmacies can do and institutions can do, but there's still a need that there are people that are simply not going to go to some of those locations that, that might be provided and that we still have to do the outreach. So thank you all for your work. Thanks, Jessica. Did you say Adrian was up next? All right, Adrian, come on down. <laughs> thank you all for having me this morning and thank you Public Health for uh, inviting me to join as a partner in this conversation. You can go to the next slide, please. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Community Health Center program and our role in um, both supporting the community throughout the pandemic, as well as and the specific vaccine um, rollout. I, as the board is aware, we've remained open during the pandemic, and that's been a very important engagement point for us, not just with the general public, but with our specific safety net population, um, being able to provide ongoing continuous preventative care services has been a critical access point for making sure patients continue to access direct health care, but then also have a place to access information about care and information about the pandemic so that they have a trusted source to go to. One of the ways we've been um, very uniquely positioned has been able to partner with public health in conversation with the state about uh, what does equity look like in vaccine rollout. Um, being able to provide efficient vaccinations is really important for a, an approach that values getting shots in arms and getting people um, access to the vaccine, but it may not uh, be the most equitable approach um, when we look at who has access to specific large-scale sites, who has trust in large-scale systems, and who has access to information. And so we're very grateful for that partnership and being able to have a conversation around what are ways that we can start out identifying better community-specific approaches to care right now. Um, Jessica highlighted in her previous slides some of the community clinics that we've been able to support with other FQHCs, we were able to work with other community health centers in the Multnomah County region um, to support outreach to patients so that they understood there were vaccination options available to them. Um, and we are happy to hear back from patients and from our partners that they've been grateful um, and very excited to participate in those community clinics. Next slide, please. I also want to talk a little bit about what our specific clinics in our own county system are being able to provide today. Um, after conversation with the state about what an equity focused approach looks like, I'm happy to announce that we now have a specific allocation for the safety net population available at our clinics. Um, this is really important because it allows our patients to continue having that relationship with their care team that they've been engaged in for years related to their other care needs and still can access for an emergency care need. Um, one story that we heard from one of our clinics last week was a patient came in and was talking with their um, vaccine team about how they knew they were eligible to go to the convention center, but had strong hesitation about getting on public transit to access that resource 
and even further reservations about if there was an interpreter available to them or how long they would have to stand in line. They then shared their surprise and joy at getting a call directly from their clinic that said, we have a vaccine available for you. Would you like to come in for an appointment? And they knew at that instant they would say yes, because they could go to a place they trusted, they could see their own team, and they could talk with staff about any questions they have directly. And that's the value of being able to offer a diverse array of options during the pandemic so that we're reaching all patient populations, and especially those that may not have trust in other healthcare systems. Today, um, I'm also excited to share that we've been selected to participate in what's known as a federal pilot program for federally qualified health centers around the country. Uh, HRSA and the CDC have selected 250 health centers nationally to participate in a direct allocation program where we can receive additional doses from the federal government. They specifically selected health centers that have a disproportionate share of homeless, elderly and BIPOC patient populations. So we were selected specifically, not just because we see those patients, but because there was an acknowledgement that we had proven that we could stay open and operational during the pandemic. And we had the flexibility and ability to provide vaccination services that might be unavailable otherwise. Today, uh, our teams are engaged in robust outreach where we are identifying all eligible patients and providing personal phone calls and follow-up calls if we're not able to make contact at the first point of outreach. We're also working with our own internal pharmacies to make sure patients who may not be in for a clinical appointment but could be going in for a medication refill can ask their pharmacist questions about how they can get a vaccine. And we're also tracking the impact as well. I'll speak in a few minutes about what we're seeing in terms of who's actually accessing the vaccine in our clinics, but we're seeing a strong response and engagement from the patients that we are hoping to reach. Next slide, please. So this um, report here, um, it's a day or two old, so it does not have the most specific up-to-date numbers, but what I can share is the relative percentages have remained the same. Uh, what you can see here is that the vast majority of the vaccines that are coming to our health center clinic are going back out to specific patient populations that identify as being from a racial or ethnic minority. Just under 70% of patients in the past week who received a vaccine identified with this group. I specifically want to call out that nearly 37% went to patients who identify as Hispanic or Latinx. Um, and this is of particular importance because we still see that population disproportionately impacted um, by adverse effects of coronavirus, including higher rates of positivity when going to testing. Next slide, please. I'd also like to talk about this slide because it speaks to the role of federally qualified health centers nationally in reaching patient populations that are not just a racial or ethnic minority, but have additional um, support needs or specific areas where uh, they might have a barrier in accessing care at a traditional health system. Uh, our entire patient population uh, has approximately 45% of patients who prefer to be served in a language other than English. When we reviewed our vaccination data from this past week, we can see that we're actually exceeding that with approximately half of our patients who accessed the vaccine um, needed an interpreter during that session. Um, from that earlier story I shared, uh, we're seeing that patients are excited to come into our clinics because they know and trust that there's a process in place where they're gonna have language support services available to them. And they won't have to worry about additional barriers going to sites where they don't have familiarity. This is my last slide. Um, so before I transition back to public health, um, would like to pause and see if there are questions about the work that we are doing or specifically about the data. Commissioner Myron, do you have a question so far? Uh, not so far, thank you. Commissioner Jayapal? Thank you, Chair, I do. One quick question. Um, want to get a sense of scale on doses Adrian, you mentioned uh, 1,100 doses per week that we expect to get. How does that compare to our patient population? I know that that's broader than folks who are eligible, but just for a sense of scale. So our, our healthcare system typically sees between 60 to 65,000 patients in a year. Um, during the pandemic, that has been reduced slightly. Um, but if we think about 
our capacity, our goal is to ramp up to approximately 1500 to 1600 vaccine doses given per week. In this past week, we've reached just under 600 doses. And so we don't operate at the same level of scale as the public health community clinics. But part of that's intentional because of the feedback we've gotten from our patients about, I want to be able to go to my own site. And that means we want to be able to stay at our site, which is going to be smaller than going to a very large gym or a very large community center. So that also naturally limits some of our ability to scale. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. Mr. Becky Peterson. Um, thank you. Just uh, first of all, I just wanted to say congratulations to getting the federal allocation um, as one of the um, FQHCs. I think that um, shows just the really strong work that um, our clinics have, have done in, in really serving our populations throughout this whole pandemic and really um, being there for our communities in the ways that really exemplify Multnomah County values. So I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, I had a question about um, the transportation. You, I, I appreciate you sharing the story of, of a person who was able to get that. Are, are, what partnerships do we have or how are we helping with that transportation factor for, for folks at our clinics? It's a great question. Um, one of the benefits that the Oregon Health Plan provides to uh, Medicaid members is uh, a transportation option known as um, NEMT, which stands for Non-Emergency Medical Transit. And it's a, a covered benefit, which provides like a taxi service um, directly to healthcare appointments um, from patients home who may not have access to transit or other options. We actually um, had a conversation earlier with some of our insurance partners about adding additional flexibility to that benefit so that if a patient is at an appointment but may not have been scheduled for a vaccine yet, is it okay that we transport them to a different site to get them access to the vaccine or have them stay longer so that they can have extended access to the vaccine on site without changing the transit? And wholeheartedly, our insurance partners have said, yes, no questions asked. We will pay for that change, no problem. Um, so we're very, very happy about that level of engagement and opportunity as well. Great, that is good news. Thank you for sharing that. Commissioner Sigmund. Thank you, Chair. Um, Adrian, could you just talk a little bit, you had mentioned personal phone calls, like I was just trying to envision what, what, so what that looks like and are you contacting people that are eligible to get the shot and scheduling them? Correct. So we, um, we're a full healthcare um, system, similar to what you might find at a Kaiser or Providence or at a smaller practice primary care clinic where we have a patient call center as well as front desk staff. Those staff have access to patient information in order to schedule them appointments and to provide outreach. This is something we do for lots of different um, appointment types. But specifically, um, what we have done is we've generated reports of patients who are eligible to receive the vaccine based on local public health authority guidance and based on the state guidance for who qualifies. And we have staff who are going through those lists, doing personal outreach to patients over the phone to say, hey, we're wanting to know if you wanna come in and get a vaccine, speak with you about any questions you have, are you interested? Wow, that's amazing. Uh, that sounds like a great job to have right now. <laughs> so I uh, just wanna uh, thank you for adding that personal touch. And I know uh, when you and I talked, uh, Previously, it, it was just really heartening to hear uh, the trust uh, that our clinics have established uh, with our clientele and how important it is uh, to get this, uh, you know, additional um, vaccine supply uh, because you all are trusted and that people just feel, you know, have a level of comfort of, you know, they know how to get there. They know the folks that are serving them. So uh, really excited to, to see you continuing this work and also really love uh, that there's been so much um, interpretation provided. Uh, I think that that's really breaking down a lot of barriers. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. You said you had additional slides. I believe the public health team is one additional section. Oh, thank you. Jessica. Yeah. So I just wanted to touch on the um, Friday media briefing that the governor did regarding the next phases of um vaccine eligibility over the coming months I, i'm sure folks watched the media briefing or heard about it but just um just to summarize if we could go to the next slide um we are um now moving into um 
uh, right now we're, we're serving folks um, that are 65 and older, but beginning March 29th, um, Oregonians that will be eligible for vaccination include adults that are 45 to 64 with underlying health conditions as defined by the CDC, um, seasonally impacted frontline workers such as migrant, migrant farm workers, seafood and agricultural workers, and food processing workers, um, currently displaced victims of the September 2020 wildfires, wild fan, wildland firefighters, people living in low income and congregate senior housing, and individuals experiencing homelessness. And then the next phase after that, there, um, the state is mapping out no later than May 1st. Um, the following Oregonians will be eligible. That will include all frontline workers as defined by the CDC, individuals ages um, 16 to 45 with underlying health conditions and uh, multi-generational household members. And then no later than June 1st, um, the state expects that we will move into phase two of vaccination. Um, and that will begin with adults ages um, 45 to 64, and then no later than July 1st, all Oregonians 16 and over will be eligible to receive a vaccine. So these are very um, aggressive uh, timelines with staggering numbers of people, and they are obviously all contingent on us actually um, receiving enough vaccine to push out into the community. But this is the general framework that we're starting to use to recalibrate our own plans. Um, as we move into needing to serve additional groups. Next slide. And this is just more of the stuff I was just uh, talking about. Next slide. That's it. Thank you. Well, I'm going to run through commissioners one last time uh, before we move to our next briefing. I uh, will start with Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm wondering about the the phasing in. Uh, I, I know you said that this is a, an aggressive schedule, Jessica, but with the Johnson and Johnson approval, uh, is there any chance that things, you know, assuming things go well, that we could be on a faster timeline? I think that's what we all hope. Um, this week, the state received 35,000 doses of the J and J vaccine. We will actually be getting um, a few thousand um, ourselves in Multnomah County. The state, um, it appears they're um, outlining the initial groups that we um, should use them for. It's obviously um, a vaccine to consider carefully with, with hard to reach populations or folks that are homebound. So we're looking at that right now. The state is actually asking us to look at um, any remaining um, adult um, care homes or homebound individuals, which I mentioned, we haven't even gotten to that group yet. So we're looking at that carefully right now. Um, I, I think the hope is with that um, vaccine and even additional vaccines to come on the market is that our supply will ramp up. There was a partnership today um, announced at the federal government between two pharmaceutical companies to ramp up production of the single dose vaccine. So I think we're all hoping that that will factor into this so that um, not only might it might be a little bit easier because it's a one dose vaccine, um, but it will increase our supply. And as we stand up additional channels that people will be able to access it more. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, you know, just as a reminder, and maybe Dr. Vines could could comment, I am concerned that people are having a false sense of security that may have been vaccinated uh, and feel like it, it's safe to go back to um, you know, pre pandemic. So, uh, I mean, even if, if you are vaccinated um, and you visit a friend who's vaccinated, you may have family members. So, I don't know, Dr. Bynes, could you just kind of comment about like what risk it, there is uh, for folks, even though, you know, two individuals who live in separate households might be already vaccinated and what risk remain uh, to other family members or coworkers? Yeah, it's it's a great question. It's hard to quantify the risk at this point with some people now fully vaccinated and some people completely unvaccinated. Um, the main benefit for vaccinated people is that if they have an exposure to COVID-19, they don't need to quarantine for 14 days, but they otherwise need to observe everything else. So masking and physical distancing 
Um, no vaccine is 100%. So there's a, there's a small chance that a fully vaccinated person can have an infection. We don't know yet if a vaccinated person can carry the COVID virus in their nose and throat, even though they're well protected from serious uh, illness themselves. Um, so I think for now, we need to stay with a universal precautions approach and give, give, give some time to answer some of these questions so that we could better calibrate our recommendations about the risks. And I say that acknowledging that people want to know if, if it's okay to hug and if it's okay, if it's okay, if everybody's vaccinated to, you know, to all be in the same room together and common sense would dictate that that's, that's probably low risk. Um, but you start to get into uh, difficult questions around people's privacy uh, who may have opted out, or, you know, maybe delaying vaccination for one reason or another. So I think I think for now, um, the answer is continued basic precautions with the exception of having to quarantine. Um, and that's that's really out of respect for people who are patiently waiting for their turn to be vaccinated. Great. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate your response. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Um, uh, thank you, and thank you, Jessica. I, you know, I was watching the the governor's um, uh, um, news press conference on um, on Friday with this, and I was like, you know, like texting it to like family and friends, like this is this is what it's looking like. This is what the plan is. So it's it's very exciting, but obviously there's a lot of ifs in the in the vaccine. Um, you know, um, supply is going to be a big one. Um, but somebody had a question. Is there has there been any discussion about um, I know in some in some there's there I've heard that they're talking about um, like the 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 vaccine the I, mean, I can't even think of the word basically like that one vaccine gives you a certain amount of coverage and that that and so they're talking about there's been talk about like do we just give people one vaccine to like basically get it out into the population because it gives enough coverage and is there any discussion about that um happening for oregon to get more people at least some coverage quicker um and then i guess the other question and this might be for um dr vines is just how much how much protection is it looking like that you get like after one vaccine or or versus two sorry, sorry. Sorry, I mean, I can take the, the one vaccine question, which I think is a really interesting one. So, and just to be clear, we're talking about the Pfizer and the Moderna, which by definition are a two dose series. So um, one vaccine is certainly better than none. Two is better than one. <laughs> and I think the, like, like so many things, the answer to this question may emerge. Um, I can share from the studies that about 10 days after dose one for the Pfizer, infections dropped off sharply and then stayed low, very low as people got dose two. So that suggests that there's there's some protection from that first dose. We don't know how strong it is. We don't know how long it lasts, but I think there are countries that are doing this experiment where we may get some lessons. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there's in Oregon and the United States, no, no one is moving this direction. Um, but with Johnson and Johnson now coming online, that re that is a real um, resource as far as a single dose vaccine um, that looks to also reliably give protection against severe hospital uh, severe illness, hospitalization, and death. Great, thank you, Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you everyone for this additional information. It's it's really, really helpful. You know, and I, I think like everyone, I'm glad to see additional groups becoming eligible, particularly some categories of frontline workers, because I think that's gonna help us reach more BIPOC communities as well. And at the same time, as everyone has said, that raises the concern about funneling larger and larger groups of people through a pretty narrow channel. So I guess with respect to that, um, is there anything that we as a county can do or are aware of about efforts to make the sign up process easier? And I know there have been sh some shifts. So we went from this sort of online system where people had to call multiple times to get an appointment to a lottery system. Um, that is still seeming to be fairly difficult for people to access. So just curious as to what you think the next iteration of a more workable, easy, more easily accessed system might look like? Yeah, I, I'm not sure what the next iteration looks like. 
can certainly tell you that we're getting feedback about the challenges to the, the next iteration, just to be perfectly honest. And we um, are in constant conversation with um, the state hospitals and healthcare systems about what we're hearing. So that's part of our role is to elevate immediately what we're hearing in these community dialogue sessions that we're talking about, about the challenges people are having. So um, the, we do need these large scale vaccine efforts and we do need ways for people to sign up that are you know, technology based and we need to continue to work through these um, issues that become exclusionary for folks. So I think it's become easier in some ways and harder in other ways. I know that I'm getting feedback today that folks that were able to actually walk through the whole registration, you know, series of questions before now it's because it's a sign up you can't actually do that so it it creates another set of challenges and that's why we're in continuous dialogue with the state about how to how to improve that i i don't know what the next iteration will look like um but my hope is by elevating these conversations that we're hearing that we can start to problem solve some of that immediately i appreciate that and i'm wondering you know from that um, for example, could the state fund us to help people walk through the system? Because that's one of the issues is just it's technology. People aren't familiar with it and it takes a long time that, you know, that that could be something that could be helpful. And another is, could we consolidate the various methods? So there's one way to sign up for the convention center. There's one way to sign up for the, the airport. And then there's another place to go for the various pharmacies, you know, so can even just consolidating them in one place, I think would help people a lot. Yeah, those are all things that I can bring forward as um, potential questions and solutions. I know that the state is going to be pushing out funding for community based agencies to support vaccination efforts um, and folks have been doing that anyway. They have had to, you know, they had to whether or not they're funded. So um, we're hoping to see additional funding um, on that front. So it really will support the work that CBOs are already doing. Thank you. Commissioner Myron. Um, thanks. Uh, I, I had a couple of questions um, and a, a comment, and uh, I think that just as you as you read out, uh, Jessica, the um, describing some of the later phases of who are um, going to become eligible for the vaccine, um, like frontline workers, multi generational households, homeless folks, etc. I, I just have to restate my umbrage at how um, groups have been prioritized by the state uh, to receive vaccines. I mean, these, these people should be top of the priority list along with elders. So anyway, um, just have to say that. And the eligibility doesn't even translate into accessibility. So uh, I, I keep seeing reference to uh, how this is rolled out as sort of the hunger games for vaccines and uh, seems seems apt at this at the state level. Um, so I I have a, a concern related to a question um, based on what was uh, put forth in the governor's press conference and you know the significant projected increase in vaccine um, is great news. I'm optimistic cautiously that it uh, actually happens. We've seen things before where this has not come through. Um, but if it does, uh, can you help me understand what our roles and responsibilities will be as the local public health authority in scaling up availability as we see more and more supply? Um, you know, I think this ties into Commissioner Jayapal's question that we're seeing, I'm getting calls, I see it happening, you know, not just supply issues themselves, but those logistics. If suddenly we get a lot more, how are we going to be able to handle that? And what are what is our role um, in that? Yeah, um, well, we have a role in continuing to identify gaps and either fill them ourselves or work with partners to fill them. We try to be cautious about stepping into uh, what I would call a direct service role because there are systems that are actually paid and established to serve people that we really want to work with. Now, if it comes to play like we've seen here, that 
by pushing everybody into one large system, you create other gaps. We then have to backfill them. So we will have a continual presence and role in likely expanding a direct service footprint that addresses all of the barriers that we've talked about. We were in constant dialogue with the state about our capacity to take more vaccines. So on a weekly basis, we're understanding from them what, what do we see coming? What's our capacity to take more on? And obviously that has to do with staffing. Um, so we are, you know, watching that very carefully. We will not be able to exponentially grow in the same way that a healthcare delivery system might be able to take on, you know, additional um, uh, work, but we have been able to grow our operations as we've learned from what we've done. So we have a definite role in filling that gap. Now, part of the reason we're partnering with um, our integrated clinical um, services with our FQHC system and others is that that entire system is going to be a huge game changer in our approach, especially with an equity framework for the, all the reasons that Adrian reviewed. So while we're just getting a little bit of a start with that, that's going to be rolling out more, um, and we really want to build on that to ensure that there's access for folks um, that, you know, again, likely are not going to go to large vaccination sites, and those barriers can be addressed through the FQHC system. I would also say, lastly, that we continually have a role in assurance, which is us being at the table, you know, to Commissioner um, Jaipal's questions about um, some of the barriers. Um, we have a role in elevating the feedback that we're we're hearing and trying to figure out creative solutions to problem solve. And that may mean changing our registration system. It may also mean working really hard with our partners to come up with mid-range vaccination solutions that aren't us, aren't the pharmacy, and aren't the large vaccination sites. So I foresee in the future that that will be a needed conversation, just looking at that list of extensive groups that we're going to need to reach. That that is so helpful and um actually i had a whole second question that was um uh about like, what we will do sort of if if the if not the opposite of the question of like if we're expanding supply um and how are we going to grow to meet that um but about how we are going to identify those gaps and in, inequities and if we don't get the supply, how to focus most on the, the people um, that are most deeply impacted and address those gaps. And you just segued so perfectly um, into that question and answered that question. So thank you. Um, I, I had um, one, it's, it's difficult in this time. There's sort of like, so many, there are the larger questions, the systems questions, and then some of the smaller questions. Um, and uh, I think Commissioner Stegman had asked about transportation. Uh, and I really appreciated the NEMT, the non-emergent emergency medical transport, that is a covered benefit for um, people who have Medicaid. Uh, what I found um, working with uh, as a liaison to our um, county advisory uh, council for disability services and aging services, that there have been real problems with non-emergency medical transport um, in the past. And are, are we, or would it be the responsibility of um, the CCOs to ensure that this benefit that is there is actually working for people, especially people who may speak another language or have um, a disability, et cetera. So not just that it's great that the benefit exists, but people are meaningfully able to access it. Do we have a role there? I mean, that's definitely one of the things that we would bring up that we hear from the community, but certainly the providers have a role in assuring that that benefit that's provided is, is meeting the need. And that's actually something that we've had to figure out on the public health side is transportation um, for our own clinics is ensuring that we have, um, you know, multiple modes of supported transportation that are not the CCO covered um, benefits to make sure that people can actually get access to the vaccine. That's awesome. That's great. Um, so, and Finally, I think is a, 
a question I think you alluded to earlier, but I, I just wanted to make sure. Um, is there a place or will there be a place uh, where all of sort of this allocation and supply is compiled and made public um, and and sort of shows how it is, it's all put together? Uh, because I'm not sure, it sounds like allocations of vaccine are getting to our county in, in a number of different ways. And it's through the CHCs now with the, the federal, um, the federal allocation, which is great, um, but from the state as well, um, there are separate allocations to jails and correctional facilities, um, separate allocations to pharmacies, separate ones to hospital systems, to ourselves as the county, um, and to long long term care facilities, maybe larger ones versus smaller ones. How how are we who who, and then how are we accounting for all of that so we kind of have a real time tracker of what is coming into the county and and how it's going out yeah we're working on a visual for our for public health for this for the work that we do um the state has some information on the full visibility of vaccine allocation and um, what's given out, and I realize that it's not perfect. I'm reluctant to take responsibility for the whole kit and caboodle. I can say that we are um, working on a better visual to show um, our allocations that are within our responsibility, especially now that we have the addition of um, the um, FQHC site that's within the auspices of the health department. Great. Okay. Um, I'll look forward to to seeing that because. It, it's hard to go to a bunch of different places to track down that information. So um, anything we can do to clarify and um, visualize that, like you said, would be extremely helpful. Um, and my last basic question is, is what is currently the best, most direct way to tell people to schedule appointments or get reliable information? I have a lot of people asking you know, how do I even go? Where should they go that is the most direct source? Well, I'm slightly biased in that I think that our website is fairly clear about the different, there are different pathways. Um, Commissioner Jayapal asked if, you know, there was a day in the future that that all of these would sort of co-mingle together through one website. Maybe it hasn't happened yet, but if you go to our website on Multnomah County, um, you will see a very clear link to how to get through the, the get vaccinated um, page for the state, which then generates um, the waiting list, which you get a call for an appointment. And then it also lists um, the different pharmacy websites that are all different scheduling systems right now. So that would be my slightly biased answer. Okay, fair enough. Um, that's, uh, that's a good answer. And I agree just with the Lord of the Rings. I, I just have to give a Lord of the Rings analogy. One, we need one website or system to rule them all and to combine them. So people just can access in one way, but yay County. Um, glad we have that one. Thank you so much. And I just have to uh, end this with a call out to Jessica and her team, Adrian and her team. I think everyone is um, working very hard. And also, I just am so appreciative of our public health team for pushing, pushing, pushing the state to have um, to try to get the state to reflect the same values that we articulate and that we um, espouse and that we we deeply believe. So I know that's a, a Herculean task, and I am eternally grateful for all the work that you're doing. So thank you. And next up, we have a, another briefing this morning. We have um, the team from uh, DCM here and DCA to talk about the risk fund and internal service rates. Crowd is yelling in the background. <laughs> All right, I think Eric, are you kicking it off? Tracy, I think uh, Tracy think is going to kick it off. Yeah, yeah. Tracy Massey, yes, come on down. down. All right, I'm going to kick it off, and we do have a presentation that we will start with. But um, 
it's always hard to follow uh, the great work of our health department and team. And I just feel like we're on the cusp of uh, really uh, a, a, a new future here, a better future. It's so exciting to listen to and hard to transition to the topic of internal services. But uh, to introduce myself, I'm Tracy Massey. I'm the interim uh, department director for the Department of County Assets and CIO. And I have Eric Ariano with me from DCM, our CFO, and Lisa Whedon, our DCA budget manager. Um, we are here to brief you on internal services and um, the associated internal service rates. This is in response to a um, budget note from the 2021 uh, budget cycle. Uh, you can go to the first side, slide, please. And um, as Chair Kafori said, we're going to be talking about two, two things, the internal services provided through the um, risk fund and the internal services provided by the Department of County Assets, um, both of which are um, charged out to the departments um, in what's called internal service rates. So um, hopefully we'll uh, get through this and we'll have, leave time for questions. I'm going to turn it over to Eric first, who will be talking about the um, risk fund. Next slide, please. Thank you, Tracy. So for the record, uh, Eric Cardinal, Chief Financial Officer. And I loved uh, Commissioner Myron's analogy to Lord of the Rings. So I'm a huge Lord of the Rings nerd, but I appreciated that, that analogy. So uh, anyways, uh, just to kind of kick this off uh, before, because we're going to, we broke the presentation out into two components, obviously the the risk fund, then the internal service funds managed by um, Department of County Assets. But just to kind of kick off, uh, the theme of the meeting is to kind of give you uh, kind of some clarification on what an internal service fund is. So essentially, it's like an account used for business activities uh, in which the customers are other funds or departments. So for for the internal services the county provides, um, you know, we're providing services to other departments that actually exist within different funds uh, within the same entity. Um, each internal service fund has a dedicated uh, fund, an accounting fund, <clears throat> where we budget and we account for expenditures and service reimbursements. So if you were to actually look at our, our financial statements, um, there's a section in there around internal service funds where you can actually see each individual inter internal service fund separated out. So you can see the, acti the financial activity for each of them for, for a particular fiscal year. So for a county internal service funds, um, any costs that are associated with delivering the services to a department are essentially charged out through what we call internal service rates. And as you'll, as you'll see through this presentation is that the method that we use to actually um, charge internal service rates is slightly different between um, D DCA and DCM. So the existing uh, internal service funds that the county does have are obviously in two departments the Department of County Assets they have facilities and property management, fleet services, asset replacement, motor pool services, information technology, uh, mail distribution, and records management. And then with it, within uh, DCM, uh, which is a, a, a fund that I manage, uh, we have essentially our risk management fund, which is our, essentially our risk pool. We have a lot of programs that exist within uh, risk management, but we just have one fund for that internal services. So combined all this, this is essentially all what we call our internal service funds um, for the county. Do you wanna go to the next slide? And so uh, to kind of kick off, this is gonna focus on the risk management fund um, policy and purpose is we we actually have a, a Multnomah County um, code uh, 7100 that actually lays out the framework uh, for our risk management pool. And essentially dictates um, that we establish a separate fund from the general fund to essentially track um, and administer uh, our risk programs, essentially our insured and self-insured programs, our risk pool. And it, it, it kind of lays out the individual programs, which I'll talk a little more through the next slide. Um, but it sets the policy, the authorization, and really, really the, the framework on what we can actually use funds within the risk fund to, to uh, you know, essentially expend on. Um, in terms of purpose, uh, the, the fund is essentially, and this is laid out in, in the, the, the code, it's proactive approach for loss prevention and reduction, protect county against financial consequence of accidental loss, 
uh, preservation of county assets and public service capabilities and to promote a balanced, comprehensive and cost effective mix, mix of risk evaluation, risk treatment and program monitoring activities. So go to the next slide. So this is a slide I'm gonna probably spend the most time on. It kind of lays out the, the programs that exist within the risk fund and then the funding approach. So, you know, I don't think we, we talk a lot about the risk fund. Um, you know, I think internal services is more kind of in, in through our budget process, more like clear and laid out. Um, but we still do very important activities within the risk fund. And so um, looking on the far right on the bullet points at the top, I'm kind of going to go through each of these individual programs. And when I say this, I'm, I'm no expert on, on these particular areas, but I'm enough to kind of give you a high level explanation on what we do within these programs. And then, um, you know, if we wanted to do a separate kind of briefing on the individual programs in detail, we can do that, but I'm just gonna give you a high level. So um, we, we, the risk fund essentially uh, pays for all employee, medical, dental, and vision and uh, pharmaceutical expenses. That's where everything is paid out of uh, for the program. That's the vast majority of the activity within the risk fund is our employee uh, medical benefits that are run through the risk fund. We also run through, we run uh, life insurance programs. So um, the standard life insurance that we provide for employees in short-term and long-term disability uh, benefits, those are run through the risk fund. Risk fund. Uh, we also have uh, what we call health promotion and wellness. These are actually um, within our benefits office. We have a, a small unit that's de dedicated to promote kind of health promotion and wellness for employees. Uh, they do a, a bunch of different things, but a couple examples of what they do. They, they organize fitness classes. They do financial wellness activities for employees. Um, they have they they manage the wellness rooms, lactation rooms. Um, those are just a few examples of what they do. They do a lot of great work, but there's a small unit in the benefits office that's dedicated to those types of activities. Then we have uh, what we call workers' comp compensation. The county has been self-insured in workers' comp compensation since 1978. And uh, we've consistently, we, we have a, what we call a risk, um, cost of risk indicator that we use, we compare against industry standards. And the county's always been um, below that cost, the cost of risk for our workers' comp compensation program. So that's why we've, we established the self-insured program and we kind of maintain that uh, self-insured program for workers' compensation. Um, we also have uh, what we call safety, uh, workers, or, sorry, risk safety, which is uh, you know within our risk management office, we actually do a lot of the, what we call uh, you know work environment safety activities. So anything that we do around complying to OSHA requirements around safety uh, of employees within the workspace, our, we have a unit within the risk management that essentially consults departments and provides services around maintaining those requirements. So that group's been, been extremely busy during this COVID environment um, in dealing with uh, requirements that Oregon OSHA's put out in terms of work uh, space and uh, safety for employees and really specifically around keeping employees safe as it, as it pertains to COVID-19. Uh, we also have a, what we call a general liability program uh, which essentially is for all the types of activities that that what we'd be insured for. So we we insure property, we have um, you know marine coverage, we have crime coverage, we actually have uh, coverage for a plane in the sheriff's office, which I learned as I was preparing for this uh, this briefing that I had no idea we had. Uh, we also have excess liability coverage. We have to be clear. We do not have a plane. The sheriff does not have a plane. But we okay. insure a plane. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I just yeah. want to make that we, clear. We, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. <laughs> we have cyber liability uh, coverage, and we also have uh, medical malpractice um, insurance that we run through those programs. Uh, we also have what we call unemployment. Um, this is kind of what we, we manage it as a self insured kind of unemployment uh, program for the county. And then we have our retiree insurance program. So for uh, retirees, um, we essentially subsidize 50% of their medical benefits from the age 58 up until 65, unless uh, they're eligible for Medicare. Before that, they get 50% subsidy on, um, on their medical uh, costs. 
Um, and then we have uh, the county attorney's um, office that's within the risk fund. And uh, so the county attorney's office provides legal services to every department, and they also support the risk management group around insured and uh, um, non-insured um, uh, claims. Um, and in terms of uh, our funding approach, um, we, we essentially fund these activities through reimbursement charges to departments, and we do it um, uh, as a charge based on payroll. So these are uh, essentially rates we establish every budget cycle that we charge on wages and salaries for uh, two departments. And so we've essentially, we configured in Workday, so every, every pay period that runs, essentially charge, departments get charged uh, certain rates for these types of activities. And then we get reimbursement into the risk fund to actually expend for these types of activities um, within the risk fund. So one thing that I did want to note that just to kind of the distinction between DCA and DCM in terms of our internal services is that if you look at a program offer, there's a line for internal services. That's for DCA type in, internal services. For um, risk fund internal services, these, these internal service reimbursements are within the payroll line because that's where we're charging it to departments through payroll. And so you'll see it in that line. It's embedded in that line versus in an internal service line by itself, if that makes sense. So go to the next slide. And so this is just uh, types of costs that run through the risk fund. Um, we have uh, you know, program administration. We have staff that administer these programs. So we, we have personnel costs, we have professional services, we have materials and supplies. And so the main uh, you know, program administration areas is risk management, uh, the benefits office, uh, the county attorney's office. Um, but the bulk of the expenses that we actually, um, that come out of the risk fund are uh, to essentially pay for insurance premiums, our medical insurance premiums, our insurance premiums from property excess liability and other items we insure. And then uh, for our shelf insured programs, we have claims that we pay and workers comp, medical, unemployment. So in the last year, just as an example, 87% of our uh, expenses last year within the risk fund were in these two categories, paying for insurance premiums and paying for claims. Um, a very small percentage is actually devoted to um, just the, the basic administration uh, costs uh, in terms of staffing and supplies and professional services. Um, and also just as a reference that I wanted to make is that um, the total FTE within the rest fund to manage these programs is about 48 FTE. Um, that's what's I think in the last fiscal year that we submitted about 48 FTE. And I took a look uh, back the last, um, I think back to fiscal year 16, and there's only been about a half FTE increase since fiscal year 16 to 21 in terms of uh, FTE to manage the risk, the risk program. So go to the next slide. And this is uh, per, the, the fund programs and the rate setting process. So looking left to right, uh, on the far left, you see the programs that I kind of talked about. And then right next to it, you have kind of a you know, very brief description of the program and then how they're funded. Like I said, they're, they're funded as a percent of payroll. So every uh, budget cycle, we reset or just reevaluate the, the rates and we, we factor in um, experience, um, previous real experience. We also factor in um, any renewal rates um, with our outside vendors, if it's applicable. And then uh, if we need to factor in actuary reviews, we factor those in into any kind of rate adjustment we have may have for a budget cycle. So I'll kind of go through each of those individually just at a very high level. So for our benefits, admins, and, and wellness is just the staffing to administer those programs. We charge a 1.1% uh, amount off of payroll. Again, this is wages and salaries of uh, active employees. And then for uh, employee medical, we actually, instead of a uh, percentage, we actually charge a rate on um, three different categories, whether you're full-time, your uh, 0.75 FTE, or your part-time. These are amounts that get charged on an individual employee um, that gets reimbursed back to the risk fund. Then we have uh, for retiree medical, we charge a 2% off of payroll. And then for these two next ones, which is, 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 is distinct from the other ones, is these ones, um, we have a, a charge off of payroll, 
but we actually break it out by department. We have the information to essentially identify where these costs are happening so we can set the rates by department. So I just, I, here on this, on this chart, I just kind of give you a, a high and a low. So as you can see here, the sheriff's office has a 1.7% rate. And then at the low point, uh, DCM has about 70 basis points that we charge them. So obviously we're workers comp, just because of the line of business, the sheriff's office has much more activity. Uh, for general liability, um, same thing. Um, example, sheriff's office is 1.5 and library is at 25 basis points for that. And then for unemployment, it's about 25 basis points, uh, very little. And the county attorney's office is 1.6% of payroll. And then the life and disability is, uh, it should be percentage there, it's 0.75% there. And on the far right, just, just for reference, I put in what we're actually including into the fiscal year 22 budget. And as you can see, most of these rates aren't changing. The two areas that are changing are in bold. We're increasing our amounts for medical by 6%. And that's based on our renewals with our um, insurance providers. And then for workers' compensation, we're increasing it by um, 10 basis points into fiscal year 22. So we'll go on to the next slide. So this this slide is probably a little bit more busy than I than I want it to be, but I think it's it it, it highlights a, a key point here. So first, ignore the top blue line, um, and just look at the lines below that. So I took essentially our uh, essentially our annual rates or charges to departments um, over a seven year period, fiscal year sixteen through twenty two through twenty two, what we're submitting for the budget. And as you can see here, for the most part. Um, the rates have been relatively flat over the last seven years. We don't fluctuate very much because an internal service fund, our goal is to essentially cover our costs and break even and cover any reserve requirements that we have. And that's it. So not to say that that we haven't in this essentially collected more money from year to year because we charge off of, of payroll and if payroll is growing, at an inflation rate, then that means there's more revenue coming into the risk fund through these rates. But a couple of things that I, I did wanna highlight here in terms of changes that have happened over the last seven years, excluding the medical piece, is that we did have a sharp, if you can see kind of the dark blue, we had a sharp decrease in our uh, general liability rate from 16 to 17, and then we had another um, decrease from 17 to 18. And that was primarily because we we had some much better experience around that. And we also, I, I think the the previous rates had were trying to build up a reserve requirement that we had based on state standards and we weren't meeting that reserve requirement. So we met that reserve requirement, had a little bit of better experience, and we brought those rates back down for um for the general liability. In terms of increases in recent years, um, we had a small increase in the benefits office from 17 to 18 of uh, 1% to 1.1% and then stayed flat for the next five years. Uh, we had a, a slight increase in the county attorney's office from 20 to 21 um, and then that's maintained flat. And then we had a slight increase, like I said in the last slide, uh, going into fiscal year 22 for workers' compensation. But for the most part, these have maintained pretty flat which is essentially our goal, goal as much as possible is to minimize any rate increases to departments in the operation of this risk fund. Now, looking at the very top, that's um, our actual medical, that's you know providing medical services to, to employees. And that's on a different axis because uh, we do it not as a percentage, but as an amount. And so that one's the one that's kind of had a steady growth and that's just kind of in alignment with you know, medical costs continuously growing um, um, around this, and we've done a lot to try to mitigate that. But you know, that's just a continuous growth that we've seen um, over the last seven years. So, go to the next slide. So this is this is a visual of, a, and this is a snapshot of actuals for fiscal year twenty, and this is total costs for the risk fund. We had about $117 million that were expended within the risk fund. Um, and about 76% um, of that, about a little bit under 89 million was devoted to providing employees with medical um, services. 
uh, vast majority of the risk fund, again, is to essentially pay for those types of expenditures. The next one um, is retiree insurance. Um, that's for the, you know, uh, that I talked about earlier. It's about 7% of the risk fund last year, uh, about 7.7 .7 million. And then um, next below that is the county attorney's office, which is about 7.3 million, about 6%. So again, the point here is to, to make is that the vast majority of our uh, expenditures are really to provide active employees with medical coverage and also retirees with medical coverage. Next slide. And this is another visual of risk fund uh, expenditures, um, actual expenditures over from 16 to 20 uh, by program. And so I, on the top band, I put uh, the two programs, the health and retiree in a, in a tan color. More so just again to highlight that they're the vast majority of uh, the expenditures that go through the through the risk fund. Um, we did, if you, you kind of look to see kind of the trend there, we see that with the medical and dental, we did have a, a sharp increase from 16 to 17, but then the, then it's kind of somewhat leveled off. We had a, a slight increase in 19, and then in eight, in 20, we actually saw a slight decrease, and, and that kind of falls in line too with retiree insurance. We actually saw when the pandemic hit, uh, obviously a lot of um, non-essential visits uh, decreased substantially for employees. And so that resulted in us having uh, a lesser uh, experience in terms of our expenditures uh, for delivering those, those services uh, to employees. Um, a couple other things that I, I wanted to, to highlight here is that, um, I think that I put them in bold, uh, unemployment, um, you can see there's a sharp increase from 19 to 20, and that's not really actually what happened. There was a small uh, configuration issue in Workday, and so thus we charge more to the risk fund and less to departments. The actual experience is more in that kind of flat range, in that 700,000 range for unemployment. Uh, for 21, uh, we're back to where we needed to be after we corrected something in Workday, so everything's fine there. For workers' compensation, we did have a, a sharp increase um, from 19 to 20. We had much more uh, workers' compensation claims um, in that time frame. Uh, this year, we've been monitoring that, and we're back down to uh, 19 levels, and we expect it to maintain in 19 levels. Um, and then for general liability and property, um, I would note that um, we're with the with the protests downtown. As we're going through our renewal process for some of our properties downtown, uh, we're definitely seeing a, a lot higher estimates that our insurance providers are providing uh, to cover these these uh, facilities downtown, just because of the protests that happened over the summer period. So we do expect uh, general liability and more specifically because of property to go up in future years because it'll be uh, more expensive to cover those properties. And then the county attorney's office at the very bottom. I, I would note that there's there's it looks like there's a sharp increase in 19 and 20, but a lot of that has to do with um, litigation around capital projects. So when a major capital project is kind of winding down, you'll see the, the couple years after it's completed, there's an increase in litigation. Um, and that's just kind of the nature of major capital projects. There's always something that kind of hangs out there in terms of litigation. So that that number there is more reflective of, of that than necessarily the county attorney's office um, having more staffing or more expenditures um, in terms of their services to departments. And so uh, the last note I want to make on this is that our average growth rate um, from 16 to 20 in terms of actual expenditures was just under 2.7% uh, for the for that time frame. So next slide. I think this is this is my my last slide, and and I'm going to ask that you ignore the top bullet point first, and we'll get that to the end, and then uh, focus on the last three bullet points. So, for the risk fund, we actually have a reserve requirements, um, and some of them are um, set by internal policy, and some of them are set by state requirements. So, for our self-insured program for workers' compensation, the state requires that we set a certain reserve amount that we have to report on annually to maintain our self-insured status as a workers compensation provider and so we are required to maintain a reserve enough to cover IBNR essentially claims uh, incurred be, but not reported so in the last year we had about a five million dollar reserve for workers compensation 
we also had a $5 million reserve, which also we also report to the state um, about $5 million to cover uh, claims that are just uh, incurred but not reported. And then at the very bottom, uh, this is for our health fund. Essentially, this is the bucket where we provide um, medical coverage for all our employees. We also maintain a reserve there to make sure that we're covering our uh, the claims that uh, had been incurred but not reported. So we have that um, amount there to make sure that uh, we're accounting for that. So we work with our providers to essentially come to those calculations. Um, so we have the right reserve requirement from year to year. And then going back to the very top one, which I think is is probably, and the reason why I kind of left this to the last is because I, I feel like I need to come back to the board at some point to give more of an in-depth overview in terms of our essentially our retiree um, medical program, which is really kind of falls into what we call our other post-retirement benefits, our OPEB. Because um, we actually have every other year, we have an actual evaluation that happens for this uh, program that's required by uh, governmental accounting standards um, in terms of this evaluation. So um, in the last fiscal year, our OPEB liability, this is essentially what it means is if this is the for that benefit of providing retirees with um, that 50% subsidy for medical, it's essentially an estimate. If the county stopped operating today, we would have to, we would owe that at some point. We don't owe it now. We'd have to pay that out over a certain period of time. So this is a true um, liability that shows up on our financial statements. And um, and the good news, you know, it's it's it, it's sizable. But the good news is that. In the last fiscal year, um, we had about 50% funding level for this OPEB liability within the risk fund. And that's been an active effort that we we made, the board made, um, to fund that liability at a higher level. And so that's a really big highlight that the county can put out there because this is this is very unusual for other government entities to fund their OPEB liability at such a good rate. Um, and so actually when I was doing the um, rating presentations most recently for the library, this is something that I really highlighted that was, uh, they give us a lot of kudos for doing that and uh, methods that we've used to essentially fund this, uh, which is really good. So we're currently funded within the risk fund at 50% level, and we have about $61 million that's devoted to that, to that pension, that OPEB liability. And I just put in this little image there, which is kind of probably not very readable, but um, if you look the far right, and this is in thousands, I took an image from our CAFR, our financial statements, our government-wide statement. So you can see that these, this OPEB liability is reported on our financial statements, the $121 million that we have to report on. And then right below that, that's our pension liability, which we, we talk about a lot more. And this OPEB one seems to be one of those that we don't talk about very much, but it's still very important and very sizable that we need to keep an eye on. But I think the county's done a very good job and been very prudent with this planning around funding this, this OPEB liability. So I would say that I, I, I plan to come back to the board in the near future to talk more about the OPEB liability, how the valuation works, how our funding approach has worked over the last couple of years, and actually provide some, some alternatives to, to how we, we fund this in, in the long term. So I know Mark Campbell, our previous CFO, had looked at alternative options, and at that time it didn't make sense to change it. But I think it's always a good idea to refresh our approach on how we we fund this um, this liability. So, so I'm go to the next slide. And I think this this is just a reference. I'm not necessarily going to cover it, but I thought it'd be good to kind of put into our um, slides. This is kind of an overview of that that retiree benefit um, that falls into our OPEB liability. If you wanted to read through that at some point, so. Um, now I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it over to to Lisa um, to cover the D DCA portion of the internal service presentation today. I think I took a lot more of my time than I, than I meant to, and I apologize, Lisa. Oh, yeah, we're gonna but we're gonna pause real quick and ask. Um, knowing, knowing that we it is 11:38, um, running through the commissioners to see if they have questions or if they want to have uh, further uh, one on ones with Eric to go into more more in depth in any of these. Um, pieces. Uh, we'll start with Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Lots of information. Um, thank you so much, but I don't have any, uh, don't have any questions right now. Thanks. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Eric. It is a lot of information and really good information. Um, you know, one question, and I think we 
talked about this a little bit when you briefed me earlier. The categories of risk that we don't charge out to departments based on sort of a calculated basis, you know, flat rate for all departments as opposed to actual experience. I'm, I'm curious as to what the rationale is for not charging out based on actual experience, given that there, there are pretty big disparities in, you know, for example, workers' comp liability or general liability. I think it, a lot of it has to do with it's 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 really difficult. Like for example, for us to to break out what we charge departments for our like our administration of benefits, um, it's really hard for those staffing to say I, I support you know the health department this much of the time versus a different department. It makes more sense for us to kind of do it globally um, for that type of charge. Um, the the employee medical that one is just per individual employee. You know, it doesn't make sense to break it out by department. Um, I would say that um, the areas that I think that might be worthwhile um, to to further kind of dig into it to see if we can actually break it out by department might be the county attorney's office. I think we might be able to um, find different ways to identify how much time is devoted to one department or over another. Because I do think like there's some departments that you know, demand a lot more legal support, just more based on the line of business than anything else that I think we could probably do a better job of kind of breaking those out to. And, and the goal there would be to not overtax, you know, a particular department that, that needs less services versus something that needs more services. So um, I think that's something I, I mentioned to you that I wanted to definitely look at in the near future. Yeah, and that that was the one I was thinking of, and and also workers' comp and general liability. I think what you said was that we charge it at a flat rate, but we track it by department. So we... No, for for workers' compensation and general liability, we actually we we actually charge it uh, at that okay. adjusted level for each. De every department has a different rate, so gotcha. and we and we right size that every year. Great, thank you, Commissioner Vega Peterson. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, Eric, for this presentation. This was um, so helpful, and I appreciate it. Um, and you, you actually, your last sentence answered one of my questions, which was, is the, is the um, percentage of payroll by department figured every year? Uh, you know, is the, um, is the percentage of the payroll for workers' comp and other things every year? And you said that it was, so that's good. Um, and the other question I had was around the county attorney's office and just the and you said one of the drivers for the increases in the last few years has been the additional resources needed um, for um, suits around capital construction projects so and i know like really the county has only taken on really huge capital construction pro um, um, projects like really within the last six to eight years um, but have we looked at as we're costing out those projects of adding this adding that piece of it to some of the costs of the overall project, like anticipating that there will be additional legal work because of that. Um, I just, because if we're not doing that now, it seems unfair that that all departments are taking on the additional expenses of the of the attorney's office if it's really part of a construction project that's, that's specific and can, um, you know, and assumedly would have, a, you know, separate and additional um, funding um, for that project. That, that's a great question, a great question that that's kind of been in my mind since I kind of took this role. So I, I do think that it's a very smart as we um, plan for these major capital projects that we build um, some of this because it, it's it's relatively unknown, but you can you can, you know, by industry standards, you can estimate what that potentially could be based on the size and the complexity of your your project. And I would say that at least for for this latest library project, some of this is kind of being factored in. Um, and in terms of our initial estimates and contingency is what might come of, of potential litigation when it is done. Um, you know, I, I can't speak for for previous major capital projects, whether we we built that into the contingency. It might have been built into the contingency, um, but I, I think it your, your question is is very valid. And I think that should be a standard practice that as we move forward with any capital project that um, our planning um, in terms of total cost and our contingency factors in what that cost may be. So um, if we run through litigation, which is very common with these major capital projects that we're not taxing the departments uh, for those costs and rather they're getting absorbed within the, the planned budget for the project. Great, thanks. And I think, yeah, I mean, you brought up the library, which is obviously like gonna be a huge one, but we also have potentially the Burnside Bridge and there'll just be others. So it'd be great to to take a look and see if that's a practice we could start doing and with that 
what that does to project costs. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Mr. Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, most of my questions were answered, uh, but I did have a question. So we don't own a plane, but we're paying insurance premium on a plane. Could you talk about that? Yeah, that's a. Um, I'll, I'll have to get back to you. I, I as I was researching, um, kind of pre preparing for this presentation, I was looking through all our insured uh, um, items, and I, I saw a plane on there for the sheriff's office. So, as you know, the chair chair clarified that we don't necessarily own the plane, but I I, I can't answer your question, but I will I'll follow up with you to clarify why we insure it and what and why we you know why we insure it even though we don't own it. I can follow up with. Okay, that. great. Thank you. That's all. Great presentation, Eric. Thank you. All right, Lisa, you are up. I'm up. So, uh, can we advance the slides a few slides? Uh, yeah, one more. Yeah. Uh, so, for the record, my name is Lisa Whedon. I'm the DCA budget manager, and I'm going to be covering, you know, like Eric said, really high level look at DCA internal services, um, the major services we provide, and how we allocate those costs to the department. And then toward the end, uh, wrap up with a look at a couple of five year trends for DCA expenditures, but also the allocations for the department. So, as Eric previously mentioned, the purpose of internal services are to equitably allocate our goods and services among departments that we serve. And DCA's program represents uh, services that are aligned with the needs of the county departments or countywide requirements for technology, for our facilities. Property management, fleet, motor pool, distribution records, and archives. And really, by pooling these resources, we're able to achieve efficiencies, um, economy of scales, and then really nimbleness in our operations. Um, next slide. Um, so this this table looks at internal services that DCA provides, and some of the specific examples, uh, kind of in the middle section there of uh, major services for IT that provides email, public facing web pre presence, uh, data management and cybersecurity. For facilities, um, they provide management of our buildings and that's both owned and leased. Also our energy management uh, program and then uh, small and large capital project management. And, and that's what Eric had mentioned before, like health headquarters, the downtown courthouse, and now our li uh, library capital bond projects. Uh, our smaller groups of internal services, they manage the fleet assets, mail distribution, records archive management, and really alternative transportation, such as motor pool, car share, and car rentals. And then we allocate those costs, uh, the cost of providing these services to the department. And, and that's the focus of this third column or the last column. So costs are allocated to departments in a variety of, where, of ways. You know, as, as outlined here, some costs are allocated based on number of FTE uh, or, or, or square footage and, and many others, as you can see. Um, and so, therefore, the larger the department, the larger the allocation. Um, so, next slide. Um, so, DCA builds an annual budget for services that include these four major um, categories. So our operational costs, they include the cost of our personnel, our professional services, material supplies, and capital outlay. Um, and then our pass-through costs, uh, these are costs like leases, utilities, postage, service requests, and these are managed by our internal service uh, divisions, and then are passed through to departments uh, for uh, cost recovery or payment. Debt is collected via internal services as well, um, the county debt uh, service obligations, the payments for the buildings, and also for um, the ERP system. And then the last uh, section here is asset replacement. So this is collected based on both long-term and short-term replacement strategies for devices, telecommunication infrastructure, and for vehicles. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this slide um, takes a snapshot look at uh, fiscal year 2021 and our adopted operating budget, which is $141 million. And it does break out this amount by um, division. So our two largest divisions are information technology at 63.4 million and facilities and property management budget at 64.8 million. 
Um, all of these divisions uh, budgets include aspects of major uh, expense categories and then that we just talked about and then are allocated to the county departments by the various methods that we mentioned earlier in that table. Uh, DCA does hold annual budget meetings with each of the county departments to walk through these costs and the services provided. Um, so then the next two slides that we're going to look at are really the five year trends and that's one. The first slide will be breaking down DCA's expenses and how those expenses are then allocated to the county department. Uh, so next slide, please. So this slide further breaks out DCA costs associated with providing services over the um, past five years, so fiscal year uh, 17 through 21. Um, our, again, our categories include our personnel costs, materials and supplies, our own internal services, debt, capital outlay, and construction services. Um, over the five-year period, the average annual growth has been 7%. Uh, the top line here is our personnel cost. Um, personnel cost average growth uh, rate is 5.6%. And really, um, it, it, I was happy that Eric spent a lot of time explaining about the health and medical benefits because um, this percentage is falling in alignment with what we heard from him regarding both the medical and the dental insurance, which grew at 3.4%. And then you combine that with the COLA and the merit increases, um, we get to, to where we are today and personnel is DCA's largest operational cost. Um, materials and, and supplies average growth rate is 3.2%. And overall, we are seeing increased costs in this area. Uh, debt um, average growth is 14.9%. Um, and with the construction of the new health headquarters and courthouse, and the ERP system, we did see significant increases from fiscal year 2018 to fiscal year 2020. And then as we move into fiscal year 2021, there is a significant decrease in the debt obligation. And that's uh, due to uh, the uh, Multnomah Building, East County, uh, and building in the Blanchard Building. Um, their obligations are met, and so they are removed from the, uh, from the collections. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this graph, uh, again, is really busy when we add 10 departments to one graph. Um, but this graph depicts each department's share of DCA's budget. Um, it's a five-year trend from fiscal year 2017 to 21. Uh, large departments like health uh, pay a greater percentage due to the size of the department and the support of their needs. Um, increases reflect uh, large program changes like addition of new health headquarters. Um, the top line is the health department, and from the trend line, we can see significant growth starting in fiscal year 2018 through 2019, and then it begins to level off. And again, this is the largest factor of this increase is the debt obligations um, for the health headquarters, and then also the increased uh, square footage. Um, and then the next, I just have a couple I want to point out here. Um, the next is non-departmental. Um, they see a significant increase between uh, fiscal year 2018 and 19. Um, this is also due to the uh, debt obligations for the courthouse um, and like health cost levels uh, level off between 2019 and 2021. And then the last item I'd like to call out um, is county management. Uh, this trend is fairly level until fiscal year 2020 to 2021. And, and this is due to that decrease in the debt obligation for Multnomah East County and the Blanchard Building as mentioned in the previous slides. Um, next slide, please. So I uh, just wanna thank you for your time today. And if you have any questions, be happy to answer. And, and Tracy still is on here. So the three of us are here to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Tracy. And we will have um, additional uh, detail um, as budget progresses uh, with current year um, information. So this is not the last you'll be hearing from our team. Yeah. <laughs> there is always more. Always, always more. more. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Stegman, do you have questions, comments? Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, I guess I have just one question is like, um, around cost allocation. So we are charged or departments are charged uh, internal fees. But then like, for instance, like motor pool, if, uh, if I check out a car, then we're also charged. So can you just talk about the difference of like uh, 
just spreading out the cost and then the actual direct uh, fees that that were charged when we actually use a service. I, yeah, yeah. So um, you kind of um, I didn't hear all of the question because it went silent. But um, let let me see if I heard enough. So what you're you're talking about is that we have our normal internal services that are are budgeted in to your budget line, and then uh, you want to have additional services. Is that is that the question? Right. Like if I uh, go check out a car. For fleet, then aren't we charge a certain fee? Or if I call facilities and want to move, you know, some office space around, aren't we charged? So I, I guess we're being yeah. charged a flat fee, and then we're also being charged a fee for service. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so we have uh, several types of of, of costs, but what I think you're getting at is we have kind of a base level that that we're budgeting for, and we allocate. And then for any additional services above that base, we do have a rate. So for the motor pool, uh, we give you estimates um, based off of last year's actual usage um, for that motor pool. And so we do have you include that into your budget. Um, and that's based off of an hourly rate or a daily rate. And so those really fall under the pass through categories where whatever usage that you are um using we pass through the actual cost and and those costs are not incorporated into our base internal service rates so for the example of the motor pool your base service rate is really just the administrative cost for running that program and then anything that you're doing as far as picking up a vehicle renting a car using car share that's based on your actual usage charge and then for service requests um, yeah, uh, facilities, they outline what's covered in base operational uh, charges, and, and that's what we're calling our operational costs. And then if, if you say you, you need your desk changed from a regular desk to a sit-stand desk, so that's really out of, out of the normal operations that we budgeted for, and so there are costs associated with that request. Um, so did that help? That did. Thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah. I appreciate it. That. Yeah. Uh, and this was just a great report. So I appreciate kind of getting down into the weeds and having a better understanding of how costs are allocated. So great job. Yeah, thank you. And, and just one other thing is that we do work with the departments each year to estimate how much they do uh, feel like they will have for service requests. And we do have them include that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lisa, so much for this presentation and um, and Eric too. I don't know I, that I thanked him for it, um, but um, I I don't have any questions. I'm just I think I'm interested, as I'm sure you guys are too, in terms of in light of COVID and everybody working from home and thinking really about the long term strategy of some of these big cost drivers, you know, for um, uh, you know for um, property management or leases or things like that, um, or building up keep, like what that will look like. So that'll be a, that, that's a longer term discussion, but I think this, <laughs> this presentation helps give us some foundational knowledge and, and good background information to have that. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lisa. I really appreciated this. And I you know also got a pre-briefing on some of this information, so I don't have any questions. But I think understanding the nuts and bolts of how this works is important to understanding our budget and what some of those drivers are. So thank you for the information. Yeah, you're welcome. Commissioner Myron. Uh, thank you, Lisa. I do not have any questions either, but uh, echo Commissioner Jaipal's comments. And it really is um, helpful to have this background as we're looking at all of that bigger picture uh, with our budget. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Lisa, and thanks, Lisa, for taking a lot of complex information and distilling it into a yeah. into some bite-sized uh, <laughs> format. I appreciate that. And again, we will have more conversations about this as we uh, proceed with the budget process for this year and look at what currently we're spending and where we've made adjustments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. <laughs> So that concludes our, our briefing, our very thorough briefing, showing all the sides of Multnomah County from public health to the intri intricate uh, details of behind the curtain, how Multnomah County works. 
Uh, we will be back again on Thursday morning for our regular board meeting at 930. So um, thank you all and 